Welcome to our final video for chapter 9 and with this it's kind of ironic because this will likely be one of our shorter videos and yet we're going to be covering three systems and three important systems but they're systems that just have not done as much attention with the research but still warrant um, our discussion of them. So, the inner ear does more than just transduce sounds. It's also responsible for the vestibular system. So, the vestibular system provides information about the force of gravity on the body and the acceleration of your head. So, when you go up in an elevator or you feel acceleration, it's actually due to this system. It's located in the inner ear, which is also why inner ear infections can affect balance or cause dizziness. So looking at the picture here, you'll first see the utricle, so that's this thing here. It's a um, fluid-filled sac, a small fluid-filled sac um, in the vestibular system. So here you have hair cells that are actually um, in a gelat gelatinous mass that you call um, the topula. So here, with the, um, the hair cells in this mass, um, when there's acceleration, it causes the fluid in here, well, here's our example. So you have acceleration, it causes the fluid to move, which then causes the uh, topula to move. So within the um, topula, there's also um, these little masses called olithus, or otholus, sorry, I can't say it correctly. So O-T-O-L-I-T-H-S. So these are actually bony crystals on the membrane of the vest in the vestibular system that increase the receptor's sensitivity to movement. So with this, one of the um, dysfunctions that people all attribute to the vestibular system, uh, probably the best known one, is motion sickness. So this is the feeling of nausea caused by passive movements. And the thought here, there's the sensory conflict theory that postulates that motion sickness is due to a discrepancy between the information being received by the vestibular system and the visual information being received. So for instance, when you um, feel like you're stationary, but you look out and you your vision shows that you're moving very fast, uh, that could cause motion sickness. Or on the other side, um, if you are reading, so the vision makes it seem like you're stationary, but you're in the car, so then the vestibular system is activated, that could also cause motion sickness. So it's this uh, disconnect between your sensory systems and the vestibular system. So, the hypothesis is actually that in, um, in the olden days, that this discrepancy may have been a sign of poisoning, and thus it leads to nausea and to, in order to purge whatever poison you have. So, as far as treating this, um, you guys have probably heard about Dramamine before. It's actually an antihistamine, which is used to treat motion sickness. So since it's an antihistamine, it's also a sedative. So one of the ways it works is it encourages sleep. It also reduces the sensitivity of the inner ear, which helps relieve the motion sickness by reducing the effect of the vestibular system. So now moving on to taste. There are actually five basic tastes. You're probably familiar with the first four. So you have salty, sour, sweet, and bitter. And then there's also umami. So umami is actually, there's some controversy about it, but it seems to be a separate taste, and it's used to detect savory or meaty tastes. So looking at the tongue, uh, the tongue is small bumps. So you, you know, they're the small bumps on your tongue, and those are called papillae. So each papillae holds one or more taste buds. And then each taste bud has between 50 to 150 taste receptor cells. These receptor cells have cilia, so little hairs again, that extend into the taste pore. And there they contact what we call tastants. Tastants are just substances that can be tasted. So your food is a tastant, for instance. 
So with this, um, because these are constantly being exposed to many different chemicals, they don't last that long. The lifespan of a taste bud is only about 10 to 14 days, so your taste buds are constantly being replaced. Um, you may have also heard that certain tastes are detected only on certain parts of your tongue. This is actually a myth that was published in an old textbook and keeps getting passed along. In reality, there are receptors for each of the types of taste everywhere on your tongue, though as you can see, they do differ slightly in their um, in the number of them. So, for instance, if you look at um, salty, for instance, there are more salty receptors toward the front of your tongue than on the back of your tongue, but regardless, there are salty receptors everywhere. And the same goes for the other um, tastes as, as well. So what happens is you have your taste receptor cells and they will, they travel to the brain through some of your cranial nerves. So you have um, vagus nerve, um, facial nerve. So these nerves help um, get this information to the solitary tract and its nucleus, then then go and project to the thalamus. So again, this is another um, sensory system that goes through the thalamus and then it goes to the taste zone of the cortex where the information is processed. The sense of smell, while being a bit neglected in the literature, actually very few people study smell. It's a very important sense. Uh, for instance, one of the first ways we know that the casserole is on fire is by smelling a burning smell. However, smell is not the same for everyone. In fact, uh, many people suffer from partial at least partial amnosia, which is the inability to smell. By and large, women actually smell better, um, they're, well, I should say, they're better able to smell than men. So ladies, your man may not always know when he smells funky. And men, listen to your ladies, because the fact that you don't smell it doesn't mean you don't smell. So how do we smell? How does this actually work? Well, on the olfactory bulb, um, there's a part that kind of looks like a toothbrush. You see it here. So here there are many receptor dendrites. Those are what look like the bristles. And at the end of the dendrite is a knob, at which point there are numerous cilia. So again, we have the cilia being used to detect. So the cilia detect the chemicals that we breathe as the air passes in and then passes that information along down the dendrite. On the other side of the dendrite, there is actually a very thin, unmyelinated axon that passes the information on to the rest of the nervous system. It's actually one of the thinnest, slowest axons in the whole body. Um, like with the taste buds, olfactory neurons have to be replaced very frequently because again you're breathing in chemicals that damages those um, those receptors so they have to be regularly replaced. So with the nose of course there are curved surfaces in the navel cavity and the navel cavity and these are called turbinates and they help direct the airflow so that it can be sensed. So the odorant which is you know whatever you're trying to sense, so the air that you're trying to sense. The odorant interacts with the receptor on the cilia um, and the dendritic knob. So how does this actually get transduced? Well, what happens is this is a second messenger system. So the odorant interacts with the receptor and it leads to a G protein. So it's a G olfactory protein. It's not golf but it's a G olfactory protein that's activated that triggers pr um, production of such a messenger. So you have, the, you have the odorant sensed and it leads to such a messenger, so such as the G proteins, going and affecting the cell, opening um, ion channels. So that's how this information is transduced. It's actually using the second messenger system where the odorant um, is detected by the receptor protein. The um, G protein leads to a um, triggering of production of second messengers, and those end up affecting the cell, primarily in opening ion channels.